Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your, uh, we are on, what is it? It's Tuesday today. Tuesday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. Hope you all had a great session out there. We're going to talk a lot about uh, the Magnificent Seven today. We'll talk about Apple. We'll talk about Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all that fun stuff, uh, which, of course, you guys may have seen the graphic for today's show, which is about the Magnificent Seven. Really, the, the tech melt up, if you will, and I, I want to have some fun with the graphics. So, here's our guest today, Mr. John Rowland of barchart.com, going to be our guest on the program talking about the tech market melt up. We're also going to look at natural gas and really whatever the heck you guys would like to discuss on today's show. So, without further ado, welcome to the program, Mr. Rowland. How you doing, my friend? Hello, Merlin. Hello. Oh, boy. You're, I can tell you're a Seinfeld fan, right? When that one right there. Yes. <laughs> What's new in your world, my friend? How you been? Uh, you know, busier than a one-armed paper hanger, doing a lot of webinars on a regular basis. We have this Friday show as well that is for our uh, subscription members, and we've been having some fun doing that and making some market predictions, some good, some not so good. So, yeah, I've been pretty busy. Market on Close is the name of that show, right? Yeah, it's on Fridays of uh, 3.30 to 4.15 uh, Eastern Time. Eastern time. All right. One of these days, I'll get on there and, and I'll torture you. You can you can interview me and, and torture me the way I torture you on this program. So I, I look forward to that <laughs> moment. We're definitely going to get you on. I can't wait. Um, let's uh, for for the sake of time, let's kind of move on through our topic. We, you and I, discuss what might be an interesting piece. And of course, this week, actually today, we had Microsoft and Google report. Uh, both uh, numbers actually looked pretty good and both getting punished. I will bring those charts up here for you guys one second. Here's your chart of Google and you can see the after hours here. Uh, significant decline in after hours session down over 4% in the after hours alone. It was down 1.16% during regular market hours. And then you can look at Microsoft, which is doing slightly better. Um, bring that one up. And Microsoft initially had a pretty big surge down then ripped back up which is why you know this is just whiplash chainsaw type stuff so stay away from earnings because of that uh right now down in the after hour session to the tune of about 1.12 percent and both of them beat earnings now last week of course we had netflix which predictably beat earnings and we had tesla which predictably missed earnings this gets a little trickier so let's talk about the tech market melt up and what your thoughts are on kind of how these magnificent seven may be driving things john yeah, you know, let's start off with it. Let's start off with a quiz, though. I love quizzing. So, love it. if I asked you, uh, and I think you know the answer to this one, if I asked you what makes price move, and or let's say what makes price goes up, and I said, is it price go up because of buying, or does price go up because of selling? Well, you know, most folks would just say, well, that's stupid, right? Price goes up. Because of buying, well, price doesn't go up because of buying. Price goes up because there's an imbalance between buyers and sellers, Correct. and a lack of sellers allows price to go up. Right? Mm -hmm. Would you agree with me? Hundred percent. Yep. So my point has been that uh, what we're seeing in the market right now is that we have this concentration of I would call it like wealth in these seven stocks and that those are the caretakers of these giant ETFs have figured out a way that they can continue to push the ETFs higher, the SPY, the Qs, and any of the, you know, the secondary ones, because their weighting of these seven or five to seven or 10 stocks is so large in these ETFs. Matter of fact, I think it was, um, I think it's a, if you look at the cues, it was at one point it was as, as high as almost fifty percent. And I think they've gotten wow. it down to about thirty percent or so. But but even like in the mag magnificent seven or large. Oh, you mean the you mean large, the weightings of that index? The weightings, yeah. yeah, yeah. The in the weightings of them. So let me just share a chart here real quick. Uh, let's see, here we go. While you do that, I'll bring up these NASDAQ weightings for people just so you can uh, see this one. It's kind of a, a fun little piece here, but we've talked about this in quite a bit. Here's the weightings so you guys can check that out. You know, Microsoft, as we speak, 8.9%. I'll round up, call it 9. Apple, round up to 9%. Amazon, 5. So right there, uh, 9, 18 plus 5, you're looking at 23 23%. 23. NVIDIA is another, call it 4%, so you're 27. You know, on, on all of these stocks here, basically it says nine because Alphabet is actually number nine and number seven. Um, so that Magnificent Seven is really your top here. You know, that is a significant weighting. And it concerns me because of micro, micro, Michael, Microsoft and Apple um, being, you know, almost 20% of that index. But it's also, 
you know, there's a significant imbalance on the S&P 500 as well towards Microsoft and Apple. And that, that's always concerned me because if things go great, fantastic. If they, you know, if these falter at all, it could have the power to bring these things down. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can kind of look at what, so here's the chart I have created. Now, I based this off of the Apple. So this is what you're seeing what Apple did today. But this is what I call the Magnificent Seven. Are we showing this? Now? Yep, yep, you're on. Okay. So this is a, a, a formula that I put together just based on the seven stocks. And you can see that, you know, we are in this super nice uptrend. Here's a 50-day moving average. Here's a nice, uh, here's a 200-day moving average. And I just put an RSI in here. I, I know that you're not a big RSI fan, but I, I'm not I a like hater. RSI. I'm not a hater. I will say that. I'm, I'm okay with it. I just What I hate, John, is when people rely on it and make it their, their piece that makes the trading you. decisions. But I, I'm okay right. with indicators. <laughs> right. It's it's really a good indicator because it really kind of shows you momentum. I think the misuse of it, this overbought, oversold condition is what is the problem. Right. But right, what we do see is positive momentum in you. So the point being is here, here you see, you know, the greater of uh, these seven or these greater ones are driving the market higher, even though if we look, let's say, for instance, here's another chart I want to show you. And this is based on the gross stocks. Now, again, remember, we're talking about magnificent. A lot of these are those so-called, you know, the AI growth or all that kind right. of thing. Um, so what we're seeing here is since about the beginning of uh, this year, let me square, square this up a little, a little bit. Since about the beginning of this year, so what are we looking at here? Well, the orange and the light orange here, these represent the Magnificent Seven, the mega caps, and the large cap of the S&P. Gross stocks. Remember, these are those like those tech-heavy stocks. Mm -hmm. The block line is the Qs. Now, the Qs were down a little bit today. I think that had a little bit to do with, with Apple. But down here, what we're seeing is the uh, mid cap and small growth caps uh, in terms of growth ETFs. Again, these ones are probably void of those magnificent seven. So what we're seeing is that this very small select group is outperforming. This is in the growth sector. So right. we're not seeing uh, a broad participation, which, which we wanted to see. We kind of saw at the end of last year as, let's say, the Russell and some of the mid caps caught up, but we're since the beginning of this year, we're not seeing that. We're seeing this, you know, these guys are taking back off. Again, I think this is a, a function of the large institutions that control these um these ETFs have discovered that hey, I only need to support these handful of stocks, and that'll make my ETF. Uh, look well and so think about it you know john passive investor you know at, at the end of the day when they look at it you know when they report the stock market oh and the you know the spy was up or the queues right. are up right you know they just as long as they see it up they feel good about themselves that kind of creates this wealth feeling and then you know they're going to continue to you know every month put money into these funds but what they're doing is they're putting more and more money into a smaller and smaller amounts of stocks to me i think that is a systemic risk as your point is if one of these large cap stocks stubs their toes then you know we could see a major correction but i don't see that right now i mean they continue to out, out perform right yep well these these seven for sure have continued to outperform and uh, i'll bring up real quick so you guys maybe want to know the numbers that happened today here is um alphabet's number so they were expecting a buck 59 a share came out at 164 all looking good on that front revenue 100 uh, sorry 86.31 billion they came out at uh, i thought they were gonna be 85.3 so they beat on um earnings they beat on revenue they uh beat on cloud storage they Missed on YouTube ads. I thought this was kind of funny because they they pointed out in the press conference um, that they missed on YouTube ads, and I think this is part of the reason you saw a big decline. But 9.2 billion versus 9.21 expected. So who really cares? They were they were off by you know a hundred by 10 million. Um, kind of cra crazy to me that that would have such a big impact. But maybe it's forecast going forward. And then their acquisition costs also declined. So Alphabet's numbers look great. And then Microsoft's also earnings per share was 293. They expected 278. Phenomenal. Revenue was 62.02 .02 billion. And they expected it to be 61.12 billion. So 
uh, a slight decrease on their revenue for Microsoft, yet Microsoft is actually kind of holding up. And, you know, as we go into these earnings and we have three big ones on Thursday, as you guys know, that's going to be Apple, Amazon and Meta. You know, those are the, the last three of your Magnificent Seven here. And, you know, I guess let me ask you this one, John. Does it does it bother you or concern you? And maybe how would you how would you approach this when you look at these markets where the bulk of the up move that we've experienced, that surge since you know November of last year, was predominantly tech, predominantly these set, these magnificent seven. Um, is that straight up red flags for you? What sort of you know approach do you have towards that? If you know if that so much is driven by just those seven out of thousands of stocks. No, I, I I don't think that that can that would be a red flag for me because you know um, you know you got to go with the trend right the trend is your friend until the bend it ends so to speak um, you know if you pull up let's say a pull up a chart of the the cash s s and p the spx um, you know since October of last year we have you know bottomed out but we've been in this nice uptrend so as long as that trend continues then you know you know you want to continue to ride that coattail but my concern it has been that what is driving this trend is just you know this this small group now what can we do like for instance you know in just recent um you know a few weeks we just made an all time high right yep. on the S&P index so again, I would be concerned if we made a new high and then you know faltered off. But as long as you know that we continue this price momentum, so some things that I kind of look for when we make new highs or when we're making new all-time highs, I want to make sure that we get enough enough follow through. So I like to see volume uh, increase in volume on on let's say a breakaway. One of the other tools that I use is I will look at uh, ATR, uh, average true range. And I like to use a multiple, which I call a filter. So let's say, you know, let's say 4,800 was the all-time high, I think it was. And the ATR for the S&P, I think, is like uh, 40, 45 points a day. So what I wanted to see was the S&P get above, let's say, 90 points above 4,800. And, well, did we get that? Yeah, we have gotten that. Um, the other things that I look for is, you know, expanding Bollinger Bands or mm -hmm. um, you know, positive ADX lines. I, th these things are, will help uh, confirm uh, an uptrend for me. So all these things are positive. All of them are there. The volume's there. The movement's there. The price action is there. So, you know, it's all go. The system's all go. It's just that that risk. So as a trader... You know, I have to manage that risk somehow so I can run with it. But, you know, what I might be doing is on the downside protection is, you know, looking to buy some puts or selling some covered calls above the market just to, you know, protect myself to a little bit to the downside. But, you know, this is what markets do, right? I mean, we can be irrational for a longer time than, you know, you and I can be solvent if we were going to try to fight one of these trends. Totally true. So that was one of the other questions I was going to ask you is, you know, we have this market, the S&P in particular, break above uh, 4,800. And I was going to ask, you know, you know, what are your, what sort of things do you look at to determine if that is a, a legitimate breakout? So you mentioned a few things. Uh, you talked about volume, you talked about ATR and using some of these other indicators. On this most recent breakout that we had, you can just go back just a couple of weeks here. Um, did those support this breakout? Did those validate yes. this one? And say, so you're saying yes at this point? Yeah, it did. It did. If you look at like there's one big candle that broke above yep. 4,800, that was on the way to getting that that ATR filter. But that was on a high volume day. That's a good sign. Uh, the ADXs are now, you know, it is now turning positive. That's a positive sign as well. Uh, there's other things. I, um, you know, again, Bollinger Bands, um, RSIs. Uh, one of the misuses of RSIs is oh, it's in the overbought <laughs> uh, area. I actually just did a, a recently did a webinar on Wednesday on last Monday on RSI. And one of the techniques that I use is called the RSI is wrong technique, which you, you buy momentum when the market moves into the overbought sector or zone. And then as long as price continues to move in that direction, you just use price as your determinant. You don't care what the RSI does. Right, it's the RSI moving into overbought was what created that 
positive momentum. Now, there are techniques you can use that will kind of tell you negative divergence or as momentum changes, something I call failure swings, where you fall out of the, out of the overbought zone and then fail to get back into it. That would be a bear sign. But I don't care about that now. All I care about is the trend, mm -hmm. the price movement. And as long as that momentum is continuing to move, or as long as the market does not fall below the candle that entered me into the market, the candle that went into that overbought, then I will continue to stay with that trend. In the in the media world, they sensationalize these events like these breakouts to all time highs that have happened in the Nasdaq, S and P, and the Dow. And as a retail investor, I think that there's this this angst now to get back in and and you know maybe take on some leverage or borrow money because hey, I got to be in on this rally. You know, as someone that's been involved in these markets for such a long period of time, having witnessed what this S and P 500 did on a breakout, what would be kind of your, uh, you know, your your advice to someone who's thinking, I got to get in this market right now? I mean, we're, here we are at 4,924 on the S and P. You've got uh, what looks like great earnings coming out, and I, I, I feel like people are going to want to be jumping on this. What's your advice? Yeah, I, I I agree with you. I think at at some point you have to say, you know. There's this FOMO, right? What you're what you're kind of pointing out, right? This fear right. that you're missing out on something. And so media again, loves to push that. They love yeah. to push that. Um, so I think it's important that you have a trade plan in practice beforehand. In other words, yeah, I'm I would have been more willing to take risk on as we we're making that new high, as I checked off the, those checklists of the indicators that it would let me believe that this new high is, has momentum. But at this point now, I feel like you're probably chasing the market. Now, right. again, this market could go just on this trajectory for the next six months, and maybe it'll never really let you back in. Unfortunately, that's part of trading. But here's the thing. I'm not really trading the S&P index because I don't believe in the S&P index. I don't think it's a good, true benchmark anymore because mm. of the fact that you have the Magnificent Seven. Mm. But there are opportunities out there. For instance, you know, let me show you a chart. And again, full disclosure, this is a company that, um, that I have in my – I have both in my momentum and also in my long-term wealth account. This is AIG. Remember, this was the, the worst stock in the world back in the yeah. GFC. But, I mean, look at that chart. I mean, that is a beautiful chart, right? I mean, it just yeah. – um, here's a weekly chart, Merlin. I mean, boy, is that – right? It, there were opportunities. You need to be – patient you need to have a trade plan and again these black lines here represents previous highs and all-time highs and then i use my criteria to let me to buy into that momentum but i want to just kind of show you a very interesting picture about this so this is hard God, to see that's but crazy gotta love reverse splits yeah yeah <laughs> reverse splits but in terms of reverse splits and we look at where we've been Right, or where we come from, we have broken out of a level of resistance in AIG. Now, this is a financial, and the financial groups is one of the sectors that has been kind of outperforming uh, uh, as of reason. But we're breaking above this. I mean, we're talking going back to, right. you know, back to March of 09. Right? Yeah, so, 14 years. Uh, where's the resistance on this, right? Where's the top on this? Well, I mean, really. And if you went in deep into this and looked and broke down some of these candles, you know, $84, $90. Now, I'm not saying that's where we're going, but that's what I'm playing for right. Right? because there's nothing in this. But again, this is an individual stock that is in a sector that has been doing well. Again, I'm not a big ETF fan in terms of trading the ETFs. I'm more of a big fan of ETFs that kind of helps me identify sectors that I want to be um, participating in. And, you know, look at Citigroup today was, you know, I'm going to, I'll give you back control here. Put no, up Citigroup. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. I'll, I can do it either way. Yeah, but uh, again, point is like if you look at like the KRE, you look at some of the uh, banking sectors, right? Citigroup had a big day today, right? Um, um, yeah, huge Ally. Day. What? C, a, symbol C. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? no, so it was a huge day today. I mean, you're talking uh, five, right. five and a half percent gain. Yeah, so a lot of these financial stocks are doing really, really well. So again, 
but the point being is, yeah, the S&P is on a run. Well, I'm not going to be just chasing the S&P. I'm going to be looking for those opportunities that are in that S&P index. In other words, those individual stocks. Nice. All right. So you you like to you prefer to play individual stocks. It's, it's interesting how we look at different people's approaches to it. I The older I get, and I, I feel like I'm really dating myself, when I was in my 20s, the early days, I was individual stocks. ETFs were boring. But I look at these ETFs, even though there there may be exposure to some of these mega cap, you know, uh, uh, magnificent seven stocks, I, I kind of fall back on the diversification of them as a hedge, as a way to protect myself a little bit because I'm I'm not as active as I used to be, right? I was I was doing 550 trades a day in the late 90s. Now right. now it, I might do two three a day. You know, it's kind of mellow for me. You know, if I get to 20 trades in a week, it, that was a heavy week for me. Um, Whereas before, that was like by 6.35 in the morning, you know? <laughs> a little bit different. So I actually like the ETFs, and I think that that's why I'm such a fan of this industry is it's just different strokes for different folks. So I, I wanted to point that out there because I think that's interesting. But I think I think that's a good point. If you're not somebody who is actively trading, right, or you're kind of semi-passive actively trading, then, yeah, the ETF does give you that balance, right, that diversification. The more stocks that you have inside of – your portfolio, so to speak, that eliminates that single stock risk. But you only need about 16 stocks in a well-balanced portfolio right. to start to mitigate some of that single stock risk. So again, um, if I'm using uh, the ETFs to look and identify where I might find opportunities, then I might look for the best of the best inside of that ETF, right? right. And again, if I was looking at the S and P again, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But as the S and P was starting to make that rally off those October lows, well, I would be like, I would have been looking at which ones are the ones that were doing well. Well, it was Microsoft, Nvidia, Apple, right? right? So point being, those would have been the stocks that I I would have been in at that time. Was I in those? To be honest with you, no, I wasn't because, again, you got to remember that we had that huge knee jerk from the October lows. And I right. was actually skeptical for most of the way up. And by the time, again, we got near those all-time highs, we kind of bounced off there a couple of times. I was like waiting to see what what was happening. Yeah. All right. Uh, interesting stuff. I was, uh, I'm over here clicking and doing all kinds of goodies on Vartchart. One thing for those of you who um, are looking at ETFs, what, I was going to try to drive home an example of what John was talking about. You know, I like the ETFs for diversification, but within those ETFs, you can find leaders and laggards. So let's say, for example, uh, you're like, okay, I saw what he did there with Citigroup. I was interested in financials. So if you go here to the top and you just go XLF and type in you know, whatever ETF is it you want to look at, if you scroll down to the left-hand side, there's a little part that says constituents, and not only does it show you um, – all the components of that ETF, but also the weightings, which I think is also a very, you know, you've seen on this show many times how I put emphasis on the weightings of these ETFs, where, you know, right now, JP Morgan, Visa, and, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway are the kingpins of this XLF ETF, whereas, you know, you might be holding yourself some shares of Invesco. Yeah, it's 0.14% of the index, not a major market uh, impact piece there. But, you know, you can also graph these lines and find out which one's the best performer over certain windows of time, kind of whittling down into that ETF to find uh, maybe uh, investment or trading opportunities. Well, let me, let me show you a kind of cool little trick that we can do with um, kind of what you were saying. So you could, what you could do is then you could turn that sector into um, uh, into – a, a watch list. So let me see if I have one of them up here. Um, well, here's just a, for instance, here's the NASDAQ. Okay. So, uh, you know, NASDAQ 100. So once you create a watch list, then what we inside of our watch list, we have ways to like, here's the main view, basically just, you know, what happened today. Mm -hmm. But then you can start looking at performance and you can look at it based on a weighted alpha or a one month performance or three months performance or 52 week performance. Um, you know, one of the other things that's kind of nice is, you know, we got these little charts, these little mini charts. So, you know, you could kind of scroll through a lot of these. Again, you know, there's a hundred in this one, but some of the other ETFs maybe not as much. And you can look at once, oh, this one looks like it's about to break out, or this one's in a nice uptrend, right? So you can look through a lot of these um, mm -hmm. stocks very, very quickly, uh, you know, use a chart, or you can, you know, you can go to our flip charts, which sure allows you to do the same thing, and you can go and kind of scroll through these. So, yeah, you just create a watch list, and then you, you do that same 
uh, technical analysis or fundamental analysis as well. Um, you know, one thing, since we're on this topic, I'm going to ask you this question. I usually was going to save it till the end. Um, you're a little late because normally I do it the first two weeks of the year, but you weren't on in the first two weeks of the year. Uh, <laughs> I do a thing here where um, on my program where I ask everybody to give their forecast. You know, what do you think that the SPX will end up at by the end of the year? And of course, there's, you know, there's no way that anybody here is going to know exactly what happens. If you do, please contact me directly and we'll, we'll settle this. But um, it's all expectations and an idea of where you think these markets are going to head. So um, the winner gets two Trader Merlin shot glasses, which I know is just <laughs> to, is the top of your list. But if you had to predict right now where you think the S&P, SPX will end the end of the year, where do you think that's going to be? So I think it'll probably be up something about 10 to 12 percent, which would used to be the no a normal S&P type of year. Now, so you want me to put I'll put eleven percent down for you? Yeah, that's fine. All right. That's so you're fine. you're at fifty three twenty or sorry, fifty two ninety. Fifty two ten, fifty two twenty. I think was my number. Okay. Right. I, I did a webinar again back in the beginning of the year. How to navigate the uncertainty of the market, and this is one of the things that we're looking at. You know, it's an election year. There's a lot of other things that you know we need to be aware of with what's going on with the Fed, right? So. In that, in that webinar, I really looked at showing you there's a lot of charts that you can look at that might give you clues to where we might go. And mm -hmm. again, a lot of folks might be um, surprised at some of them. Like one of them was, you know, I'm looking at a cardboard manufacturer, right? And when you think about it, if they're doing well, that means that goods are being created and boxed and shipped to Amazon, right? Yep. Blah. Um, you know, I know we're going to probably talk about energies, but... It, you know, yeah, crude oil is definitely something we can look at in terms of, you know, a headwind or a tailwind in terms of the cost of energy. But there's actually a, a positive correlation of the the heating oil, the U.S. The ultra low sulfur diesel, that says that you know you want to really see diesel prices rising. That's a good sign that you know there's a lot of demand, right? And that's a good sign for the the market. So that positive correlation. So I looked at a lot of those indicators, and they're not showing strength right now. But you know, in an election year, history has shown that in the year leading up to uh, an election, that the market performs above ten percent yep. by the end of the election year. So I think my prediction was peak sometime in not in January, bottom sometime around April sideways for most of the summer and then finish out strong after the election and going into the end of the year. All right. I've got you on the page here. 5220. That would actually be a 9.46% gain for the year. I'm using the uh, um, the December 31st close, which is 47.69 on the SPX. So there you go. You're on the list. Good luck with those shot glasses. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Big Eb says, "Don't crowd my 5200, John." <laughs> nice. But it's like, is it like uh, um, Price is Right? You know, you can't go over. No, it's like closest. That? It's just closest. I'm not going to be that picky, <laughs> but closest to it get wins. You know, it was interesting. Um, I, I was like doing it because I don't know. I, you, you're never spot on, and you know, last year I went quarter by quarter. I you know I thought we'd have a a strong first quarter, a flat to weak second quarter, and then I thought third and fourth quarter would be weak. And um, I was completely wrong on the fourth quarter, that's for dang sure. But, you know, it's right. just, it doesn't really matter. It's really what your plan is and how you, you know, react to the information that's presented to you at that moment in time. But it's always fun to kind of think, how do I think this year is going to end up? All right, here is the next question. This was actually a question from um, Alex, which came in, and it was dealing with natural gas. So I thought I would use an old graphic that we have of you, which is fantastic. Alex, thank you for the question. The question was, what is happening to natural gas? I love we've got John Rowland with natural gas burning in his hands over here. <laughs> um, we have witnessed some unbelievable down moves in natural gas. I mean, it seems yeah. to be like one of the, the worst possible futures markets out there. Uh, what's your take on it? And if you want to share yeah, so any charts, do you, do you, you have a it. natural gas chart up at the top right now? I don't, but I can go bring one up. I'll see if I can find yeah, it. Yeah, bring one up. up. So, I mean, it's really all about fundamentals at this point in the season. We're into late into the winter season, which is the high demand season, and just you know, we just didn't have a winter again, and yep. you know, two years in a row now. Now we did get a kind of a little spurt last what two weeks ago. We you know, polar vortex and a little cold 
went through most of the mid mid continent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we did get a little bit of a spike out of the, out of the market. Now, you, if you're using a rolling over contract, you probably won't, don't see that, that spike that we got up to above $3, $3.40 which was the February contract, but the, uh, the March contract got pretty close to $3. And then, you know, the weather broke and the market came down. So yeah. I really think it comes down to this and this is what, um, you had actually mentioned this in the past where, you know, you look at kind of $2 as being the floor, right? And, yes. and right now it's at two twenty. And I've had a lot of people ask me, they asked me this when it was at three and then three, 70 and 350 like should i buy it should i buy it? it's like well it's, it's falling aggressively right now it's it's extremely risky to do so um but you know the closer we get to that two dollar mark the more attractive it becomes as a potential swing trade yeah i i think in terms of historical levels i think sub two dollars is a is a low risk buy right um you know you got to be careful though because how will, are you going to buy that right are you going to buy the futures contract right. well we're going to look at that in a second or do you buy, let's say, one of these leverage ETFs like Boyle? Mm. Mm. You play Boyle on momentum. You don't want to play Boyle for a long, long term because because it gets reset every day, and, and one down day could wipe out three days of up days. Yep. Um, Absolutely. You know some of the ETFs, right? Maybe um, a UNG, right? I think the way to play natural gas, if we do get a rally, I think it, it'd probably be the natural gas. Producers or maybe some of the pipelines. Uh, there's still a lot of um, consolidation that's going in that sector. Just recently, uh, Chesapeake and I think it was Range are going to merge. So I think that's going to continue. So I think there'll be some opportunities. But here's a chart we're looking at. This is uh, the EIA, the uh, U.S. Energy Information Administration. And this is that weekly storage report that comes out on Thursdays for natural gas. There's one that comes out from crude oil on Wednesdays. And this is what we're looking at. So here we see um, how much gas we have in working storage. This is the reason what drives natural gas markets on a, a yearly basis. And this upper line, this blue line, represents current storage. So you can see that we are above the shaded area, which is a five-year average, and the dark line is the five-year moving average. So here's the range, and here's the five-year moving average. So we're above that. How much are we above that? Well, we're about 4% above last year and 5% above a five-year average. Now, a few weeks ago, before we had that weather, we were like in the 12 to 15% above. So that weather did draw down a little bit of this excess surplus, but we're moving very quickly towards the end of the winter season. So mm -hmm. these are like bananas have been sitting on the shelf. <laughs> right, they're going to turn black pretty soon. So, yeah. uh, so that is what's driving this market right now. Barring any late season winter effect, I do believe that you're probably going to see spot gas prices probably below two dollars sometime between now and the end of March. Now, what I would be looking for is this is down here where it says total stocks. Here we are at 2800. If we could. By some miracle, by the end of March, as we start moving into what is called the injection season, get down below, let's say, 2,000. Get down to, let's say, 1,600, 1,800. Then I think that would be an opportunity for you to start looking for um, buying opportunities in some of the uh, natural gas producers. But I would not be shorting it down here, but I do believe that uh, prices are going to go a little bit lower before they go back up. Now, what I am seeing on the uh, the big picture is that you look at forward contracts. Here's April, May, June, July, August, all the way out through where we're going to go up, come into the winter uh, summer season. You can see that they're at the 250 level, and the winter contracts are still, for next year's winters, are still above $3.00. So storage guys are starting to nibble down here. Mm. In other words, you know, they're kind of buying they're buying on dips. So I think there is opportunities uh to the long side, but I, I think it's I think patience is probably the key uh in the long run here. There you go. Alex, patience on natural gas. All right. Um, what other things do we have to go over? Uh you brought up something interesting before we joined today. 
Um, and that was talking about Dow theory. And then I'll get to some questions. I have got a few questions from people, so we'll, we'll try to get to those. Um, but talk to us a little bit about Dow theory and how you think that it applies to today's markets or maybe doesn't apply to today's markets. Because this is something that was, you know, you're talking 1800s is when Charles Dow came up with Dow theory. So we're, we're, we're well over 100 years old on this bad boy. Still relevant, still carry some weight? I mean, you know, if it if it works, you know, don't change it, right? So, um, so basically, Dow theory says this, and and this is what I have a chart that I just put put up here. Basically, Charles Dow said that there was only two indexes back then, and one was the in industrial, and one was the transportation. So he believed that in order to confirm trends or primary trends, you need to see both indexes doing the same thing. In other words, if the transportation was making a new high, industrials needed to make a new higher, vice versa. And that was because there was only, only two indexes. But his thought was that if you had the industrials making new high, right, creating goods, right, you could create all the goods you want, but you got to deliver them, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to see transportation doing well. So his philosophy was that it, you needed to see both of them making new all-time highs, and that would confirm your primary trend. So what I have here is a chart, and this is the Dow Jones transportation, and then the blue line, that's the black line, the blue line represents uh, the industrials, right? The industrials have been making a new high. You can see it's made, if you go back here, you know, it's made a new all-time high. But the transportation is not. It's not even near its all-time high. As a matter of fact, it's well off. And if you looked at this chart, you could make an argument here. We're kind of getting this divergence or maybe even be the beginning of a, a new downtrend. Uh, you know, we did, haven't made a new new low, but, you know, it does look like the momentum of the transportation is, is faltering. So, yeah, I think this is, again, this goes back to – what's underneath the surface of these large uh, ETFs is that there's a lot of cross currents going on. And one of the cross currents that we're seeing is, yeah, industrials are doing okay. Materials are doing okay. But, you know, economy may not be as strong as it is. Maybe the consumer, even though it says that the consumer is spending more, but are they spending more for more products? Or are they spending more because the price of those products have gone up and so um in this case the dow theory who says you can't confirm this uptrend in the s p or in the industrials excuse me until the transportation makes a new all-time high and we're not there right now so again this could be one of those filtering systems that you use to help you look at that you know that macro mega big picture yeah you know um interesting so i i'm gonna I was going to jump into that conversation, but there's, there's another one I want to get to quick. Um, as far as – let's keep on transports. I, I won't shift topics here. As far as transports go, you know, does – do you think that it holds the same weight as it did? Because, yes, we had to yeah. ship all these goods and services. You know, it's kind of like copper. Uh, everyone in, in my entire career as a trader, they'll be like, copper, copper, copper. Copper is the industrial metal. If copper does well, that means expansion. Dr. Copper, yeah. And, and now it's like, you know, when people build homes – a lot of it's not copper anymore. It's PTEX. It's plastic. So, you know, that that benchmark historical thing we've looked at that has carried all this weight may not have as much relevance. And I would argue that a lot of what we're talking about now with, um, you know, industrials, a lot of those products is, is shipped digitally. You know, you're looking at things that are, you know, software as a service and, and technology pieces have gone right. from physical shipping of, of packages and services to streaming it. So do you think that plays a, a part in maybe the... Uh -huh. Yeah, I think I think you got to think about we have a new economy, right? And it's more of a service economy. So I agree with you 100. And and there are some people who says the new Dow theory would be to look at the S and P and and the Nasdaq. That and in that case, you would get a positive uh, correlation and a positive signal. So yeah, I agree with you a lot there. But I'm just saying that um, in the big picture, as an investor. I would be more comfortable or confident in the stocks that I'm picking when I see this broader um, uh, appreciation, a broader expansion, um, a price appreciation across all sectors, not just, you know, a, a handful or just a few, you know? Yep. 
Nice. Um, let's go back to natural gas for a second. Uh, there was a comment that came through here from E. Thomas. Uh, e. Thompson says, natural gas proposed to stop exports four days ago. You know, the Biden administration um, put a pause on uh, natural gas exports. And, and I think that maybe part of the reason you're seeing natural gas implode like this is that was something that was kind of maybe maybe in, in the pipelines uh, for seeing. Uh, it's a little bit different. What okay. they did was they've stop processing the permitting of new LNG uh, facilities. So I don't think that has uh, an effect on natural gas. If if those facilities were allowed to uh, be completed, then that would have a positive effect. What we, we are seeing is that there is one um, an LNG factory. That's the Freeport one, that one that had issues Fires. A, a, few years, yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. One of their their trains that's the facility is down and so that means that the gas that they would have normally turned into lng is being pushed back into the pipe and pushed back in the system and so that is a, is is one of the reasons why we're seeing natural gas prices falling down what's going on with the Biden administration is that they're just not permitting any new Got ones it. now their theory is that you know this is a natural resource that's for the United States. Why are we creating and selling it globally, right? They kind of want to hoard it. But again, that doesn't make sense if you think about their green initiative and the, how they're moving away from, you know, carbon footprints. So I think it's more just, uh, you know, more of a political uh, thing that's going on with them. Mm -hmm. okay. Because, you know, there is a lot of natural gas LNG factories here in the U.S. state, and we're now the largest... I believe I think we are the largest uh, global producer of LNG. So nice. Uh, there was another this. question. I'm, I'm going to answer it, but you can act as my uh, my all knowing expert because I don't. I think I know the answer to this one. But Pepe says, "Can we get a negative natural gas numbers due to too much supply, like we did with crude oil back in 2020 during COVID?" And uh, my answer to that would be no, because the problem was they didn't have a place to put the oil. This case, if someone stuck with all this, they would just flare it off. It would just yes. just burn. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I, I think, you know, what we discovered is that there is no zero for futures contracts, right? That was so, so unbelievably mind boggling to me to watch it go <laughs> to negative 40 bucks a barrel. And I was trying to buy everything, but all my trading platforms said, sorry, can't buy anything with crude oil. I was like, come on. But actually, what was weird is like when you got down below that, everything flips upside down. It's like the, you know, the inverse world so you don't buy down there you actually sell down there which you know if you were on your trading platform and you said oh i gotta buy this i gotta buy this right. you would actually have been selling it right because everything right. reverses because it was negative it, yeah the bids become ask and ask becomes bids <laughs> so bizarre so bizarre it is so bizarre yeah um all right let me real quickly wrap up here for so um i had this up here earlier uh as you guys know John does the education for barchart.com. Uh, if you're a Premier member, you can watch his Market on Close, which is every Friday. Uh, that's Premier and Plus now. We've made it for Plus um, subscribers as well. All right. There you go. Opening the doors even more. Uh, that's yeah. uh, going to be Fridays at 2.30 p.m. Central Time. About a 45-minute show. All kinds of great topics. But there's also a an incredible amount of webinars that are available. Obviously, there's live webinars, which used to be just about every Wednesday. Maybe he's taking a vacation here because he's taking Wednesday off. I don't see it's one for tomorrow. It's about three, three, three a month. Okay. Um, but on a really wide variety of topics. So for those of you who are, you know, scouring the market for knowledge, uh, you know, you could fall down some rabbit hole and end up with some complete moron on YouTube that has no clue what they're talking about. Or just go to Bar Chart and check out some of John's stuff from a guy who's been doing this a tremendously long time uh, and has a lot of uh, great market insights and knowledge. So there we go. Yeah, I, I, I is, you know, yeah, I want you to be a um, bar chart subscriber. I mean, that's all to, obviously my ultimate goal. But my webinars are not a sales driven. Right. My webinars are educational, and yeah, and I do everything from you know simple indicators to you know strategies to options, um, you know trade plan everything. You know a lot of the great stuff that you do, Merlin, is I just put it in an hour show and just give folks you know right down to you know the nuts and bolts of what they should be doing and show how. 
how bar chart can help them and then they can make that decision for themselves yeah and you and you also have some guests i, I did I had the honor of, of doing a, a bitcoin one or cryptocurrency one for you a while back and that was a lot of fun too so he's got a lot of um, prominent people in the industry that come on and will give presentations as well so you guys should definitely yeah, check it out I, actually i came on your show because i wanted to invite you back just to come back i don't know if we're going to get you on moc or maybe on one of the weekly shows, but I want you to come back just before the halving, which I think is in May, right? Yep, uh, it's it's end of April, early May. But so you know, you know, John, I'm really I'm really shy, and I don't really like being on camera doing interviews. So I don't know, it's gonna be a stretch for me to 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 go to come well, on your program. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll, we'll have you in, but you know, late March, early April, so we can kind of talk about that as yeah, well. Absolutely, uh, happy to do it. Um, yeah, it's, it, it'll be a very interesting time as well as we get closer to elections and seeing where these politicians are starting to line up because that will have an impact on uh i think the the trajectory of cryptocurrency and particularly bitcoin uh going forward so yeah happy to yeah, do it anytime so, well i mean let me get your feeling i mean you, you know you had scott you have scott mccormick on occasionally you had bill at 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 his yeah on what what do these guys think that interest rates are going or that do they believe, as I do, that the long end of the curve is really what's going to drive the market over over most of this year? Uh, so, you know, when I'm with Scott, it it he, we cover so much material. I can't remember specifically what Scott's was, but bon, but uh, Bill Addis is obviously very very bond oriented, and his feeling is long end of the yield curve is going to be going up. And and again, the steeper that goes, the higher that goes, the bigger the impact it has on the markets. And and I I tend to agree with him. You know, if you look I at I do too. You know, there's the simple math behind what Bill presents to me. It's just like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. We have the highest level of debt we've ever had. In order to service that debt, we need to raise money. So you sell 10 years and you sell more and more of that. But now people realize that it's a bad bond. Not bad, but it's it's getting a little bit shaky, right? A little bit of risk there. You're going to talk about downgrading the debt of the government. Uh, that, that hurts. So now all of a sudden you got to offer a higher yield to get people to buy your stuff. And global markets like China and Japan are going, well, we don't want your 10 year. So now we got to offer a higher rate. You know, at some point, I think this yield curve inversion is going to fix itself, and all of a sudden, we're going to get a fairly steep yield curve because the Fed most likely is going to shorten or lower the the short end of the yield curve here soon. So, all of a sudden, real quick, flip back up, and we'll see how bad that hurts the markets. Right, exactly. You, you, you got to think about this crowding out effect the government would have, right? If the government is doing treasury issuance and they're getting five percent, or they're, they're, the market is demanding five percent, well, then what does that demand for, let's say, a corporate? Um, borrowing seven, right? eight, that nine percent, seven, right? eight, nine, right? Yeah. And that you know that cost of capital is definitely a huge headwind for uh, markets. But could, there could be this possibility where we could see the long end of the curve rally and the short end falls, and still the market could still go go up because of this exuberance. Right? Yeah, and it, it definitely is exuberance. And you know, it's an interesting part. I I, I make a presentation um, talking about the power of the asset classes and. You know, I think the average retail investor thinks that the stock market rules the world. And it's like stock markets like the Chihuahua compared mm. to the other big dogs out there. And bond markets and currency markets are really the the massive drivers of, of global markets. So, you know, certainly Bill Addis really opened my door, uh, my eyes more to bonds than, than I probably wanted to. <laughs> I feel like I'm immersed in the bond world. But, yeah, it's interesting stuff. Very interesting. You think it's going to you think it's going to get steeper? I, I think, yeah, I think no matter what Jen and Ellen tells us, this Wednesday about their issuance. I think what they're doing is they realized that in the last year that trying to issue it's too much, too much, the market couldn't um, digest right. it. So they're trying to, you know, kick it down the, or back end it um, this year. But yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we have to um, refinance a trillion dollars worth of <laughs> debt interest alone this year, which is just absurd. Yeah. I just can't believe it. In my lifetime, I would never have thought that. Yeah, well, who knows? But but in your lifetime, we make it to a quadrillion, knowing that the way we're spending this kind of yeah. Nuts. Right? Who's going to stop them? Exactly, no one at this point, and uh, maybe an uprising, uh, which is again is one of the reasons I like digital assets. But we can talk about that another time on your program. Another time. All right, hey John, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Been a while. Um, I got you down for your forecast, so hopefully uh, we'll see if we get you some shot glasses by the end of the year. Uh, yeah, put them in my uh, in my glass. I see. I see the decanters in there. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Someday, maybe you'll have me on on Friday show. I have a nice 
stock market glass so perfect we can, uh, do some whiskey drinking and i love your little badge behind you of btu very appropriate yeah, that's, that's good floor badge yeah. the floor badge is btu that's cool all right my friend well you have a fantastic day i know it's late for you so thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it and i look forward to talking to you again soon all right buddy cheers all right, all right, take care Guys, that was John Rowland of BarChart.com. You want to know more information, go to BarChart.com. He has a ton of free webinars that have been archived. And again, it covers just about every topic you can possibly think of from call spreads. Uh, honestly, uh, Dr. Alexander Elder, this was the one he did back in November 1st. He's a, a legend in the industry um, from a psychological perspective. Now, this one's talking about Dr. Alexander Elder's favorite indicator, which I haven't watched this one. I probably will go back because I've read a couple of his books. Uh, but again, so many great webinars here for free. And if you're looking to you know, enlighten yourself, learn more about the markets, that's a great free stop to do it. And of course, Bar Chart with all their great resources, etc. All right. Uh, I need to wrap up here because I, I need to get over to the office here very, very soon. So let me just jump straight into... Um, your announcements for today, and then we'll go look at earnings calendar. Uh, from Tuesday's perspective, we didn't have groundbreaking um, news, but we did have some. We saw a nice increase here in the Case Shiller Composite 20 home price. Oh, hold on. That was expectations. It should have refreshed. It didn't refresh. Uh, we saw nice gains in the Case Shiller Composite 20 home price index, but not near the expectation. It went from 4.9 to 5.4. Markets expected 5.8. The good news is you're starting to see home prices continue to move to the upside. And I think that has to do with the falling 10-year bond. As that 10-year falls, more people have access to uh, cheaper mortgages, and that would cause more sales, which drives prices up. Now, for tomorrow's activity, let me bring up the 31st, the final day of January. We have a lot of big stuff. The big piece right here is at 11 a.m. Pacific time, which is the Fed funds rate. We'll see what Jerome Powell says right now. Pretty much... 100%, we're gonna to get to 5.5% and stay there. No increase, no decrease, we'll stay right where you're at. Uh, but watch that press conference 30 minutes after that. That will be exciting. It will create a lot of moves. It will make for a lot of popcorn trades of the day. A lot of charts are gonna look like this right as that announcement comes out. But you also have the fallout from Microsoft and Google's earnings announcement, which are both down now in the after hour session. Now, you also have the ADP non-farm employment change, which comes out an hour and 15 minutes before the markets open. So I'm telling you guys, a lot of big information. It's the earning stuff that I think is going to be very interesting. And again, here's your stuff for today. Let me uh, refresh this because it should have given you the final numbers because AMD, Google, all of them have reported. Here is your calendar. So um, notice notice the, the bad news here. A lot of red, um, a lot of red. Even though you had Pfizer beat earnings by a large margin, they're now 1.67%. You had Alphabet beat earnings, they're down almost 6%. You had Microsoft beat earnings, down 2%. AMD, in line with expectations, down 6.5%. So a lot of negative stuff out there. This is not very good, in my opinion, that you had this maybe buy the rumor, sell the news. We had those sharp moves up in tech and in NASDAQ and S&P. Now, all of a sudden, we're rolling over. As Pepe asked me earlier, uh, do I have my short position still? Yep, I have my short position. I didn't add to it. I wanted to, but I just didn't have time to do so. Um, but that's your economic st or announcements for today. Here is what's happening tomorrow. Much lighter, but you have Boeing, Qualcomm, MasterCard, uh, Align Technologies, Table Pharmaceuticals, MetLife, Philips 66, uh, Novartis. So some big names in there as well. But really, we'll go back to this economic calendar, which I just did. Um, that's the big stuff for me, the FOMC, until we get later on the week into Thursday with the other earnings. Rob says bearish. Um, you know... I, I, I don't know. I, at this point, I don't have a, a dog in that fight. I'm looking at the way the markets are performing, and it would make me believe that tomorrow and the next couple days are going to be down days. Now, with what's happened with Microsoft, what happened with Google, I expect those to drag the NASDAQ and S&P down tomorrow. But the wild card is, what does Jerome Powell say at 1130? If he comes out with rave reviews and all these great things for the markets and, and says what the market wants to hear, it might erase what Microsoft and um, Google did today. But remember, we also have on Thursday, Apple, Amazon, and Meta reporting. So, you know, you've got all kinds of pieces here, which again, I, I love the graphic of the popcorn trade. I feel like this is what the week's going to look like, you know, just all sorts of wild action. Now, Oliver says flat. What I can't, I can't tell you which way it's going to go because I just, I just don't know. 
What I can tell you is that the moment that the rate announcement happens, you're going to get a big move, either up or down, and most likely it will retrace right away and get these big zigzags, which is why I tell everybody just stay away from a Fed announcement um, and, and also the earnings after hours. So uh, that's going to do it for me for today. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. Oh, almost another hour show, but hope you enjoyed that one with John Roland of BarChart.com. Um, always a great honor to have him on the program. Just a great guy. Loves sharing his knowledge and just full of information. So if you want to know more, you can go to barchart.com. He's got a bunch of free webinars and his market on close show every Friday. And I will probably be on that show at some point here in the near future. So thank you, my friends, for joining me today. No guest tomorrow, so I'll have a chance to do a deeper market dive and also go into your listener questions. If you got something you want covered on tomorrow's show, email me, tradermerlin at gmail.com or put it down below any of the YouTube videos. Have a fantastic remainder of your day, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care.